gift of life. We thank you for health and that we are here in a sound, with a sound mind. Lord, as we are about to embark on this journey, we ask that your presence be with us. Touch us, Lord God. Touch the presenter as he expounds on science and technology for Caribbean development. Bless the hearers and help us, Lord God, that we will be edified. Touch us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you our EVP of Academic and Student Affairs, Professor Bernadette Warner. A round of applause for her as she commences this day. It's always a pleasure to say good evening to this crowd and to have the opportunity to warmly welcome everyone to the final in our distinguished lecture series. On behalf of our Executive Chairman, Dr. Wilson Adams, our Deputy Executive Chairman, Mrs. Geraldine Adams, our Executive Chancellor, Professor Gale, our UCC Board and other uh, board members, faculty, students, staff. We are very pr proud to have the final in our Distinguished Lecture Series today, and we are very, very happy to extend a warm welcome to everyone in this room. On behalf of us all, I would like to offer a very special welcome to Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison, a notable scientist who has contributed approximately 50 years in the field of science and technology. He's an expert in biochemistry and endocrinology, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. And of course, Professor Gale will give you a lot more of the history of Professor Morrison in a short while. Professor Morrison has earned numerous accolades during his professional life. However, I would like to take one moment to share with you that in 2012, he was awarded the Honorary Doctor of Law's degree from the UCC for years of sterling service in the fields of education and the medical sciences and for extensive pioneering research in diabetes. So we're very, very proud of uh, Professor Morrison as one of our own. Final in our series of the, the distinguished lectures will culminate in September 28th with the first of our annual conferences. And um, of course, these events form part of the research agenda which we are developing at UCC. We hope that you'll be enthused by the topic presented this evening, science, technology, and innovation for Caribbean development. Professor Morrison will be exploring issues that will continue to confront us, that confront us now, but given the development in modern science and technology, which not only drive and determine our growth and sustainable development, but does so in a very broad way. And so we all need to be uh, cognizant of these developments and the impacts on our well-being. Thank you so much, Professor Warner, and I would like to uh, add my personal warm welcome to each and every member of the audience, and uh, to tell you that I'm sure that you are about to have to partake of an intellectual feast, and uh, encourage you to settle down, as Professor Warner said, to listen actively and to prepare your questions, to engage in a conversation at the end of the presentation. It is indeed a pleasure to uh, introduce to you in more detail Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison, uh, who uh, actually uh, started off, well, let's, I will start off in 1992, when he was appointed Professor of Biochemistry at the University of the West Indies, and in 1994, Professor of Endoc Endocrinology. In 1999, he became Co-Vice Chancellor and Dean of the School for Graduate Studies and Research at the University of the West Indies. Now I'll take you 
1993 when he founded the University Diabetes Outreach Program. You'll hear a good deal more about diabetes because this has been a major interest of Professor the Honorable Errol Morrison. In 1999, he received the Gold Musgrave Award for Outstanding Services in the Medical Sciences, as well as the National Honor of Order of Jamaica, OJ, in 2001 for distinguished services in biochemistry, medicine, and the voluntary social services. In July 2006, he received the Queen's Gold Medal to the Commonwealth through the Royal Society for the Promotion of Health for his service, services in medicine and medical education. So, as I said, diabetes and its management and control and treatment has been a late motive of Professor Morrison's distinguished career. I would like you to know that uh, despite uh, being a very, very serious researcher and was accomplished a great deal, or perhaps on account of this, Professor Morrison has a wonderful sense of humor. Thank you so much, Bob. <clears throat> it is so refreshing to be introduced on a different note because for the last several years, the first and only thing that's mentioned in my resume is that I have eight daughters. <laughs> I want to engage you this evening <clears throat> in a soul-searching look at ourselves using science and technology as a yardstick as to where we are going as a people. When I say science and technology for Caribbean development, let us not forget that Jamaica is 42% of CARICOM population-wise. So much of what we do you know, irrespective of the loud noises, forgive me, those who may be from the islands. Um, irrespective of much of the noises that you may hear, Jamaica leads the way in the CARICOM Trust. And much of what we do is the yardstick that drives Caribbean development. So, I just want to put things in context because it was about five years ago I introduced to the uh, Ministry of Education here, the concept of STEM. It was nothing new elsewhere, but just to bring it to the focus, science, technology, that's, and let me just be quite uh, broad-based in our definitions. Because when we say science, we're talking about knowledge, a body of knowledge, okay? Yeah, I don't want you to be thinking of a white coat individual in a lab, you know, with all kinds of, you know, uh, microscopes and bunts and burners and things like that. It's a body of knowledge. And how you use that knowledge is technology in its broadest context. Engineering is only one aspect of technology, how you use the information you have. But let us never forget, and I urge the Ministry again a few years later, not to leave out the arts, because it is from the arts that much of our scientific observations emerged. When you look historically, it was the philosophers, you know, who were some of the earliest uh, uh, thinkers of the environment and encouraged study as to how the environment worked. So the arts needed to be put in, and so we converted it to STEAM, the M referring to mathematics originally, but in its broadest context, it is measurement. Because anything you do, if you can't measure it, you can't determine progress, right? So M there refers for measurement in its broadest sense. And then now, having all of this knowledge, using it, measuring it, what do you do with it? We want some new thinking. Right? How you use it to do new things, old information used in new ways, or new things in new ways. Innovation. 
and in a part of the world in which we live, we need some new things to sell. And I use that word in the broadest term, to the global marketplace. So we can earn our way out of poverty. Because when you think of the Caribbean and CARICOM, there was one famous politician who could not understand the whole thrust of CARICOM because he said, all we're doing is bringing together a group of poor countries. So we will become one big poor grouping. And you will see some of the challenges that we have as the Caribbean later on in my presentation. So having innovated, we're saying, let us put, as we say, our money where our mouth is. And let us be entrepreneurial, using these new products to create income, to create jobs, to create wealth. So the acronym has moved from STEM to STEAM to STEAMY. And I guess that will continue to evolve. But getting very, not xenophobic, but focusing on our Caribbean self, I want you to take careful note of this quote which I have taken from former Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies in the 60s, who went on to become professor at Princeton and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1973. Sir Arthur Lewis, actually a St. Lucia. It's interesting, and of all the Nobel laureates, they have ordered two. They have both come from St. Lucia. So we need to study that water down there. <laughs> but anyway, there are some things, he said, which we in the Caribbean will do best. And there are some things which only we in the Caribbean will want to do. If I say nothing this afternoon, I want that to sink in. And I bring it back at the end of this discussion. And why am I emphasizing that so much? Let us just take a little background. Because from the 1990s, 1995, in fact, the Caribbean heads of government all agreed that they wanted a new thrust on tertiary education and on graduate education. And they ensured that the quality thereof would meet international standards. So they introduced a number of you know, quality assurance mechanisms, etc. But what they were hoping is that we would be producing a country of graduates, new thinkers, able to innovate, do things new, even take an old thing and do it in a new way. To be able to assess, you know, what is happening in a variety of scenarios. To look around the world and adopt best practices. And you have to adapt them for what we need in the Caribbean. You can't just take it lock, stop, and buy it from elsewhere and lock it in, in the Caribbean. You need to adapt it, shape it, customize it. And it's important to, to recognize that things don't remain the same in the sort of movement of inertia that we think of. And we need to be able to anticipate movements ahead, a concept called foresighting. Because you need to be able to look at trends and to move quickly. As a people, we have tried to encourage
tertiary education and other ways. Governments have been putting subsidies in a variety of ways, whether it's scholarships or bursaries, what have you. And they put it in place a student loan scheme, a revolving scheme, as you know. And we have been trying to get the private sector involved. And I've spent the better part of the last 15 years or so moving around the Caribbean and trying to push the private sector the value of investing in education and the tertiary level. Because if you look at what is happening in the East Asia, the so-called tiger economies, what's happening there, you know, is businesses are looking into tertiary institutions and taking the brightest and the best with good attitude attitude, taking them into their businesses for what you may call an internship or, or depending on what you describe, elective period or whatever. And they'll have them there for some, maybe three to six months or, or you know, alternating depending on their time allotment, you know, in their class structure at their institution. And they are exposing them in their businesses from second year university level and they whilst there the business pays directly to the institution a contribution to the students fees it's inadequate fees you know, that causes most students to drop out of tertiary education. And you all here, sitting here, you know that. Almost every year you hear about students being barred from exams or they have to leave for this. Stuff. But it's lack of funding. That's one of the most important causes. And what is happening, because the private sector has moved into the institutions, taken them on the students, and helped to pay their student fees, the students can more readily complete their studies. And what do you think happens when these students graduate? If they are able to get a job back in the same company that has you know, given them the studentship, these students can begin within three to six months to contribute to the bottom line of the company. You know what I mean by the bottom line? The profitability. This is one of the reasons we have spent a little time on this because the private sector is fundamental. Government can't pay. You heard the, the furor recently in the Jamaican setting where the government tried to help some students pay their student fees. And we know that that is not sustainable. But it was a gesture. We understand the, you know, the philosophy there. But in terms of a sustainable uh, development, we need private sector input, and they need to come into the institutions and begin to utilize them. And the students win because they are able to get their, 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 their programs completed. And the private sector wins because they get graduates, new employees who can contribute to profitability in the shortest possible time. Okay? Of course, it is always recommended that we're the individual, whether through own endeavor or family or friends, to help to cover the cost of their programs. Because look at what we are finding here. A social economist is from the Caribbean, the Professor Vanus James, who did this study in 2006, 10 years ago. We haven't gotten any other data to challenge what we have here. So even if it needs a little tweak, and it's a very conservative you know, set of information here. But the point that was being made is, 
if you look at the money that you would have paid for the tuition for a variety of programs and compare that money to having put it in the bank. Ten years ago, we would have said the bank could give you no more than 10%. If you went into a Ponzi scheme, that was uncertain. So we're thinking of the best practices nowadays, you are lucky if you get a good 5 6%. But the point is, taking the money that you would have put in the bank over those three years, using some of it, or all of it, in investing in the tertiary level education, on coming out within the first year of employment, they can begin to see returns on that investment in their education of this kind of level. The physicists or the scientists in the workplace, in the breweries and so on, you know, can return 39% on that money. In the various agronomy uh, situations, uh, you work in the field of farming, and this is now serious, you know, uh, developmental farming, agricultural sciences, 38%, law, 35, businesses, and you can see, those of you who have a touch of business experience, that these are ultra, ultra conservative. Okay? The social science, but the greatest problem is our teachers. Okay. Huh? And that has not changed, uh, but still, it is better to have trained in the teaching area than to have kept that money in the bank. I'm simply putting this story here for all to hear that it pays to stay in school. It pays to get an education to the highest level. And you can scrap all of these because you know that the average lawyer, by the time you call him, it's five stones per minute on the phone. So, I hope they're not about it. <laughs> but the whole potential of income earning is tremendous. So all of this is a very conservative socioeconomic map that was put together. And when we're talking about the training, there are so-called centers of excellence. And you know, there is a tendency for institutions to just say, we're a center of excellence. You declare it. It doesn't work so. I was once in an institution where they wanted to negotiate excellence. It doesn't work so. And those of us who have had to work hard for the academic accreditations that we've gotten will stand and fight and defend any such compromise. And the World Bank has put together some, now they are, again, not knocking ourselves, but we just need to aspire when you're coming from third world countries. You have to be better than the best to get properly recognized and to be allowed to sit at the table of equivalence, right? Internationally. You don't have to take it from me. Go up there, you see for yourself. You have to be head and shoulders above the competition. Because research can be expensive business if you get into the kind of thinking that some of the first world nations will tell you about research. But you want to recognize its breadth. And I'm keeping it at that, at that baseline. Right? And what they're saying is a research university. Because if you're not a research university, then you're really a training institution. Not the university level that is going to take its equal seat. I remember as a young doctor trying to publish papers. And my dean 
of the faculty of medicine coming to me and said, you know, Errol, I'm really troubled by the lack of research in the faculty. You're needed to tell me. Our colleagues see several patients every day and they can't find something to talk about, even any one of these patients. And I told him, you know, as you say that, it's, it's, it's interesting because I work in diabetes. And one of my major areas of research that changed my whole approach to the thinking and the application of managing diabetes was when I was in the clinic one day and this lady brought her husband who was a diabetic to see me in the clinic at the university hospital. And he wasn't doing so well and I was trying to find out and I said to him, and we following the guide about your eating and your medications. And you say, yes, doc. And the wife pumps up. Is that true here, doc? <laughs> because every time I give him his meals, he said to me, yes, dear. I just have my diet. No one want the food. <laughs> And that changed a lot of how I began to see the way in which we're going to manage our people in some of the chronic diseases. And it led on to some other things, which is another lecture. But just giving you some of the background when I say research, observation, and putting that observation in the world. As simple as that. And it changed a whole course. And it resulted in a whole school of research scientists, you know, in the field of diabetes, you know, at the University of West Indies. But what the World Bank is saying is that for an institution to really get the international recognition as a research-based university, at least one third of them, of the faculty, should be involved in something creative. Thinking something new. Why do you turn the door lock this way? Is there a possibility of pulling it out to open it? I'm just using a simple example of doing just doing something different. Thinking differently, what you say out of the box. Okay? Institutions like ours need to question what you would call the status quo. Right? That is why you're here at this level of training. And what you're saying is we want at least 30% of the faculty involved in some creative thinking. And what happens with that kind of creative thinking? We want to see them able to register it in some way, a kind of copyright. It doesn't have to be a full-blown pattern, but you protect some of your new ideas. I tell you, it's amazing the kind of innovation that can come out. You know, we just had a science fair uh, promoted by the Scientific Research Council, of which I'm chairman. And we went and looked at some of the exhibits, you know, of the schools. Just primary school, and there's high school as well as some colleges. But there was a little exhibition here that amazed me. A young fellow had a little tabletop and he got two razor blades and he put them opposite each other at about a centimeter apart. Then he got some, you know, the water, the drink bottles, the plastic bottles, okay? And he brought one and he stuck it in the little uh, centimeter space. And then he turned it. He turned it. And out came a belt of plastic about this wide. And the bottle would give you several yards. They use these 
what you would call straps then to make brooms, to make brushes, to recall chairs, the base of beds. And what he said to me, you know, prof, just one broom that I make takes 40 plastic bottles. Suppose we were to make an industry of that. All of this plastic bottle clogging up the gullies and into our harbor could very well be impacted by that simple observation. What caused this young man to think of how he could? Now he's selling some brooms and so on, you know, but we feel that that is a kind of innovative thinking that we need to be encouraging. And we're encouraging it to get it registered. That's how you put the two blades because that again is the trick in the trade. Doing something new, don't just leave it at innovation. Be entrepreneurial about it. And let me tell you, if you are living in the Caribbean, our private sector has not bought into the support of innovation. Very few. And that is one of the things holding back the Caribbean. But let me further point out to you, we talk a lot, and the politicians in the room, out, outright politicians, right. we talk a lot about job creation and poverty eradication and economic growth. Creating jobs. But do you know that we don't know what jobs need to be created? No manpower study has been done in Jamaica or the Caribbean for decades. In fact, since the 60s, we don't know. So we're using a, a gut feeling or a guesstimate or what is around us. We're not looking down the road. And you may say, but Technology is changing so fast that you can't predict rubbish. The economists, and I'm not one, but I've seen them at work, create their own foresighting formulae that allow for that variable, that, that variable parameter, okay, that change. And you can do a good guesstimate. But the point is, we're talking, you have too much lawyers, or you know, you have too much doctors, or you don't need historians, or what do they know? It's all gut feeling. And if you continue that kind of thing, you won't be any better than the engineer who did a feasibility study to move water from the top of the hill and carry it down to the valley. And when he presented it to the politician, not the Jamaican one, no. the politician said, I want the water to go uphill. <laughs> Defying the science, right? And because this is a political mandate, a political directive, what he wants to see, right? He is not prepared to look at the reality that is driving, right, these activities. Nonetheless, in 2010, a group of us sat down a think tank and we came up with a few what we call critical needs for the Caribbean. Nursing, land surveyors. You know that no more than about 15% of the total land in Jamaica have titles. The rest of it is my grandfather <laughs> from the top of that coconut tree to the dandelion. That is what you call point finger title. <laughs> Common law title. That is how Jamaica's land is a portion. And we don't have enough land surveyors to, to demarcate and to divide and to have proper titles 
issue. So land surveyors are a major, major you know, need. Pharmacists, they say that was 2010, and here we have more than enough now. But these were what we call the critical needs in 2010. I still wait for a couple of hours even in a private pharmacy. So I don't know that that has been properly saturated. Teachers, especially of the technical and vocational era, what it is they are trying to say is, you know, we have a cultural thing where it is the child that probably doesn't appear to active or to what you would call it home right that you send them to go in the woodwork or to go learn a trade as we call it and it is now becoming an important deficiency across the region people who can do things or plumbers or welders our woodwork specialists and so on. And because you may think that plumbing is, just use an example, is an inglorious occupation, you go to say North America and the money they are making will make you cry. Not because it is little bit, but because when you think of what you are earning back here with all of your fancy degrees, you ain't earning half of what they're making up now. But they are registered. And they're certified. Okay? And these people, it's not like many of our workmen here who learn something on the, and they don't understand. Many of them can't even read a measuring tape. I'm serious. Woodwork men can't read a measuring tape. And this is a kind of lack of infrastructure that we have in the region. We ain't going nowhere without proper, you know, technically equipped. And it goes way back into the 50s, I can recall, my headmaster being amongst the first to introduce woodwork in, in school and then the boys would go to school that long, you know, the square, square thing. And they would hide it because Anyhow, you see them with that, you know it would work, they do it. <laughs> and that was in for day. Okay? And Mr. Powell was literally pillaried because he introduced that in the school system. Soon, Kingston Tech and so on would come on, and you had the, the technical schools. Now, they're trying to call them STEM academies. We looked at the shortage of skills in the region, environment, sciences, architecture, engineering, topping them. And when we talk about law, that everybody's jumping up, oh, too many lawyers. Look, you can't find one that can adjudicate or assist you in a problem in the world wide web. You can't find a lawyer that can really take you through the problems of sports development, right? and the, the, the intellectual property. They are all very limited and thinking of criminal work or in terms of, you know, transferring property and so on. This is a serious deficit. The agriculture, business and management, those are it. But look at what the major universities in the Caribbean, and you know, there are, at the last count, there are 39 universities in the Caribbean. Not necessarily with major edifices, but they come in with their briefcase, okay? And they do a number of discursive uh, programs. Hence the, hence the humanities is one of the big things. There's medical sciences, nearly 25 medical schools in the Caribbean, okay? And again, how we scoff at these, be careful. In 1998, I went with then Professor Rex Nettleford to look at the offshore school in Grenada. It was being scoffed at by my alma mater, you know, right? And they thought, oh, that medical degree is not of much use. When we went there and we saw their facilities, 
it was far, you know, more modernized, far more, you know, sophisticated than we had at UWI. And it was a shock for the group. Needless to say, that was 1998, the offshore school in Grenada. It is now the St. George's University of Grenada with a charter. It is not only a medical school, it is the national university and it employs one in three Grenadians. One in three Grenadians. Just using an example of our attitude. Again, it's a colonial thing and we're not prepared to embrace new thinking. For us to really move forward, I think we are going to have to form some serious partnerships within the Caribbean. We're too small to be too individually you know, functional. We need to be prepared to work together collaboratively, regionally, internationally. But did you know that we have four maybe five universities and a number of tertiary institutions and colleges, 20 out of them. And when the government and private sector have a problem, the consultancies that are given out to study those problems, UWI, UTEC, and NCU combined get less than 2%. 98% go north. You know, shame. It means that they have no faith in us. We who are training our tertiary persons, we who are involved, and everybody's to blame in the private sector. I remember sitting in a meeting and hearing a private sector person boast that my company is being monitored from Nebraska. Every motion, everything that is happening there is on the computer watching Nebraska. Mind you, we don't have the technology to use it, but something has to give if we are going to be a contributor to the new thinking and the upgrading of our region. Look at the Organization of Economic Cooperation for Development. They spend 30% of their budget in research and development, which gives them 50% of their income. 30% of the budget, private sector and government combined, is assigned for research and development. And as a result of that, and the innovations and the new products that they can sell, they are getting 50% of their gross domestic product out of that R&D. Look at what is going on in the Caribbean. We're spending, and this is UNESCO data of 2004. It hasn't changed much. We are spending Zero point one three percent of our budget on research and development. Are you surprised that we're not earning anything on the poor? Because less than one percent of our GDP is coming from anything new. Hmm? So if we don't have anything new to sell, we're not making any money. So we are one big poor block. Look at what is going on. The data out of the UNESCO Institute for Statistics in 2004 pointed out that all of those rapidly developing countries, in fact, they're now first world states, Japan, Singapore, Korea, North America, are all in the region of about 3% right, of their GDP being used for science and technology and innovation. Did you know that? Of all the music listened to across the world, 
And we have ignored reggae music, you know, developed on its own. And we negated it as downtown, what do you call it? Um, Zing fence music, or, you know, back of all music, ghetto music. It became a six billion US dollar business in a decade. And we're still not studying it. All of Bob Marley's works are now in California. Did you know that? Reggae studies are in Tokyo. Dance Hall Queen was Japanese. And they now have, well, look, we were in Stockholm a couple years ago. If you listen to me, you can ask my wife. She said, no. And we're on a, we call it a, a sidewalk cafe. All five of us black people in a sea of white people. And they serve up, hearing us talk with a strange lingo. She came over and she said, where are you from? And we said, Jamaica. She said, Jamaica? Oh, I have a daughter who is just gone there. And we said, what for? She's gone for some ballet competition. It was at the time of our dance hall competition. We're not taking advantage of what we have. Not to mention, and we've been saying it for years, that of all the plants that have been declared as having some kind of health value when you extract them, 50% of them go here in Jamaica. So, as I've been trying to point out, banana, dead. Sugar, dead. Tourism, struggling. Bauxite, dead. We need something to come alive. And the newest potential on the, on the market, on the horizon, is that of the nutraceutical industry. And we are saying to you that these are areas that need special study. When you put new music or develop a sporting activity, any kind of amusement, you invest one dollar in it and you get a return of over six dollars. That is a massive return and most of this stays in the country. Unfortunately, these creative uh, aspects don't employ a lot of people. That's what the labor productivity means. It's interesting that the greatest productivity in terms of labor employment comes out of horse racing and betting. And there are those of religious pursuits who will not support that. I'm not going to argue that. But here it is, the greatest employer and a not too bad return on your investment, almost four times. Video production, their advertising agencies, and look down here. The, the, oh, the call centers that are coming in, and the communications, they're not turning over much money, but they are giving you, in terms of what we get, it's 49 cents roughly, but you're employing a lot of people. So finding a kind of balance is going to be of some importance at governance level. But let us not forget music and sport. The biggest turnovers of your money, and that is where Jamaica has excelled. And we're still poor. So something is lacking, that of making good use of our strengths. We need to focus our domestic industries on the areas of our strength. The tourism taking 
advantage of our natural environment, and we need to study what keeps our sand so white and clean, what keeps the, the underwater world that they come to snorkel and observe, you know, and we want to attract our reverse brain drain and have a money game as we try to get investors. And one of the first set of investors we should be looking for is our own diaspora. Wherever they are, they will come and invest here. If we can ensure them of the infrastructure, like what we're just doing now, of course, we have to watch other things to make sure the environment invented right, crime notwithstanding. Our universities, colleges, institutions must be relevant and emphasize innovation. In fact, more and more we see institutions putting on programs in innovation and entrepreneurship. And if we can create new products and sell to the global market, then we are on our way to development. First, I will take a minute to thank um, the Public Proceedings Committee, um, the Student Affairs, the Marketing Department, Operations, and uh, the ISNT for putting this meeting together. We want to thank you very, very much. Professor Morrison, we can't thank you enough. If we want to clap, we'll clap till the morning. <laughs> yes, you've made us ashamed, but you've also made us very, very proud. You've shown us that there is hope, that it can be done. You're an icon, you know, you know that yourself. We can only follow in your steps. We hope that when you see calls upon you again, you will make yourself available. <laughs> Understand that whatever it is that you have said here, there are people here who have taken you seriously, and the seeds that you have sown today will be a few. This gift is just a token to remind you that you said something here that will be remembered for a long time to 